Due to the graphic nature of this case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and sexual assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. On April 13, 1924, snow blanketed the grounds of Oregon's Deschutes National Forest. Owen Morris and Hervey Ennis braved the weather to journey to a remote cabin in the woods, hoping to find their friends. Oh, what's that awful smell? <coughs> oh, whatever's in this pot is awful moldy. Ugh, it's like it's been here for weeks. I don't think Ed would stand for this. Your brother a messy type? Dewey's clean enough. And if he wasn't, Roy would make him clean. That marine training's drilled pretty deep. Do you think they're out trapping? No, look. These are their boots. And their rifles. Hervey, they wouldn't dare go out in the snow without them. What was that? The closet. Open it. Oh, Hervey, why me? Fine. I'll do it. Ah! Easy, Owen. It's just a cat. Poor thing's skin and bones. Wherever our men are, they've been gone a while. Three months. How do you reckon that? The calendar. It's still set on January. Harvey, where have they been for the last three months? This is our first episode on Oregon's infamous Lava Lake murders, where three fur trappers were killed under mysterious circumstances in 1924. This week we'll learn about the victims' lives, the fateful trip that would end in their disappearance, and the rescue effort that led to a horrifying discovery. In the early 20th century, Bend, Oregon was a minor trade hub for ranchers and farmers. In 1905, the town only had 500 listed residents, but in 1911, all that changed. The Oregon Railroad completed construction of a stop in Bend, allowing both people and goods to travel through. Well, this attracted the Brooks Scanlon Lumber Company, which opened sawmills in 1916. Buildings sprang up to accommodate Ben's expanded economy, and by 1920, the population exploded to 5,000 residents. Big things were happening, and people flocked to Oregon for new opportunities. Three Bend residents, Edward Nichols, Roy Wilson, and Dewey Morris, all worked at Brooks Scanlon Lumber Company at some point before their untimely deaths. Edward Nichols was born in Ohio on June 12, 1870. He grew up on a farm as the oldest of eight children. In 1895, at 25 years old, he married a Canadian woman named Liza Ann Young. They had two daughters, Annabelle in 1896 and Janetta in 1904. During that time, the Nichols family lived in Michigan and Montana, where Edward worked as a blacksmith. By 1910, Edward moved his family to Deming, Washington, where he worked as an engineer for a logging company. It was in Deming that the Nichols family became friendly with another couple, a man named Dan McClellan and his wife, Margaret Leoella Wilson. Leoella's brother was Roy Wilson, who would have been 22 in 1910. We don't know the circumstances of their meeting, but it's likely Edward and Roy met thanks to Leoella and started a long-lasting friendship. While this friendship began, another relationship in Edward's life ended. By 1913, around the time Edward moved to Oregon, he and Liza got a divorce. We don't know why, although some speculate that Liza was not a fan of Oregon. She returned to Washington to marry an older man, and her daughters went with her. By 1920, Edward was 50 and living in Bend. The census records his profession as general laborer. Though his brother Guilford also lived in Bend, Edward probably led a lonely existence, living in a room at the Bartlett Hotel. How can I help you? Room for one, please. Check out date? I'll get back to you on that. Starting over couldn't have been easy. Luckily, he found a new opportunity, thanks to another Edward. Edward Logan was around Edward Nichols' age. Though primarily a logging contractor, Logan was also a successful fur trapper on the side. The fur trade was incredibly active in 1920s Oregon. 
professionals and amateurs alike would journey into the woods to set trap lines, a series of gadgets designed to catch animals like foxes, marten, and mink. It was an arduous job, especially in winter, but when sold, the furs yielded a profit that more than made up for the grisly task. It was a market that everyone wanted in on. As a railroad contractor, the entrepreneurial Logan couldn't spend months away from his job in Bend checking trap lines. So in 1922, he brought Nichols in on his business. Nichols, how much do you know about trapping? Well, I've done a little, but I hear you're the master salesman. They say your wife's got the fanciest furs in town. <laughs> Catherine's certainly happy and warm, but I do well because I've got a system. Whole thing works better with a partner. Go on. I got this little cabin up by the lava lakes. Perfect place to raise marten and silver foxes. You stay up there for a few months, set the traps, feed the animals, and I'll cut you in on the profits when we sell the furs. Mm, sounds a little lonely. Then bring a friend. You two can trap for yourself on the side. And if you want to brew some moonshine up there, well, prohibition be damned. What do you say? <laughs> oh, you're a darn good salesman. But haven't you had bad luck with partners before? Sure, Rob Llewellyn got snow blindness and had to quit. And yes, Cephas Gott couldn't stay on account of accidentally shooting himself. Logan, this job sounds cursed. Relax, Nichols. You'll be fine. I think I will bring a friend. Edward Nichols had just the right partner in mind. Lee Collins was a fast-talking charmer in his late 30s from Idaho, who had worked with Edward in the summer of 1922. They ran a pack string for tourists and campers at the Cascade Lakes. A pack string is a line of horses or mules connected by ropes, helping a group move through the woods without losing animals or supplies. From fall 1922 to spring 1923, Edward and Lee Collins lived in the cabin in the Deschutes Forest, raising foxes and collecting the furs for Logan to sell. It's estimated that the value of the furs they collected from Logan's five silver foxes would have been around $1,800, which in today's money amounts to almost 28,000. Even a small cut would be a handsome payoff, but when Edward and Collins returned to Ben to give the furs to Logan, their mutually beneficial arrangement soured. Logan refused to sell the furs. By August of 1923, Collins was furious. Ed, Logan's cheating us. No, he just says the market's low and we won't make as much off the furs. I know it's a pain, but if we wait a few months, he'll sell them for more. He's lying. After months of work up in the cold while he sits back and bend? Get a hold of yourself, Collins. Trust the man. So you trust him. I see what's going on now. What does that mean? You and Logan are holding out on me, aren't you? Collins, what? You sound insane. <laughs> you want insane? Fine. If you don't make this right, I'll come back and, and kill you both. Lee Collins was convinced that the two Edwards were cheating him out of his hard-earned money. So he went back to the Lava Lake cabin to get his revenge. He stole $500 that Edward Nichols had stashed away there. $500 in 1923 would come out to around $7,500 today, so this was no small act of theft. But Collins didn't stop there. He also broke into Edward Logan's home in Bend and stole a diamond ring and beaver fur coat belonging to Logan's wife, Catherine. Edward Nichols reported the stolen $500 to the police, blaming Collins. He probably felt like he was taking control of the situation by giving the authorities a solid lead, but upon meeting the police, Edward learned something shocking. Lee Collins didn't exist. Lee Collins was actually named Charles Hyde Kimsey. Kimsey was a wanted burglar who escaped from a 14-year sentence at the Idaho State Penitentiary in 1915, eight years before the events at the cabin. After robbing both Edward and Logan, Kimsey fled Bend on August 21, 1923, and his escape was just as awful as his past. Still operating under his alias, Lee Collins, 
He hired a taxi driver named William Harrison to drive him 60 miles southeast of the city to the Last Chance Ranch. He claimed he was going there to buy horses to use up at Lava Lake. Just as they passed the ranch, Kimsey turned violent. Hands where I can see him! N now, Mr. Collins, put the gun down and let's just work this out. Before Harrison had a chance to talk his way out of the holdup, Kimsey knocked him unconscious with his revolver. After Harrison awoke, Kimsey force-fed him a poison intended to kill him. With Harrison at death's door, Kimsey stole his cash, coat, and shoes, tied him up with bailing wire, and placed him in a nearby cistern, a receptacle built to hold rainwater. But miraculously, Harrison awoke a few hours later. <coughs> Hello? Hello? Help! Somebody help me! <coughs> Harrison vomited up the poison. He broke free of his ties and made it to the Last Chance Ranch to report the crime. A local sheriff found the taxi's license plates abandoned near the cistern and was able to follow the car's trail, but it soon ran cold. With no more leads to follow, Kimsey successfully evaded capture. Kimsey's freedom worried Edward. He could return at any moment seeking revenge. But in the meantime, Edward still needed to make a living and Logan needed somebody to collect more furs. In the fall of 1923, Logan asked Edward Nichols to spend another winter trapping at the Lava Lakes cabin. Logan, I told you that job was cursed. But Collins, or Timsey, or whoever the hell he is, he's gone. And you need the work, don't you? Right, but I'm not doing it alone. Not with Kimsey on the loose. Who are you gonna bring this time? A pack of trained attack dogs? No, a Marine. The last time Edward spent the winter trapping at Logan's cabin, he teamed up with a criminal and lost his hard-earned money. But this time, he had a plan to make sure that things went differently. And they did go differently, though not quite the way he wanted. This time, Edward Nichols would lose much more than $500. When we return, we'll see Edward assemble his full crew before heading out to the cabin for the last time. And now, back to the story. In the fall of 1923, Edward Nichols of Bend, Oregon was preparing for another winter at a remote cabin by the Lava Lakes. It was a trip that undoubtedly gave him some anxiety. His former partner, Lee Collins, a.k.a. Charles Kimsey, was a wanted criminal who thought Edward cheated him out of the profits from their trapping. Kimsey had already stolen $500 from him, but he still might return for revenge against Edward. He couldn't risk being alone all winter, so he called on his old friend, Roy Wilson, for backup. Roy was the perfect choice, because he was a Marine. Name, age, and place of residence? Harry Leroy Wilson, Roy for short. 29 years old, Silver Lake, Oregon, but I was born in Colorado. Occupation? I'm a logger for the Brooks Scanlon Lumber Company. Hmm. Five foot nine, 165 pounds. Sure you're tough enough? I can hold my own. So tell me, Roy Wilson, why are you interested in enlisting in the Marine Corps? Why, sir, to serve my country. Harry Lee Roy Wilson, known as Roy to his loved ones, was born on January 12, 1888, near Rifle Creek, Colorado. He was the only son of Sarah Jones and Charles Wilson. Roy's father, Charles, was a mining prospector, and his job took the family to Washington State in 1895, when Roy was seven. The Wilsons lived in Washington for about 15 years, until Roy was in his early 20s. Around then, Roy's sister, Leoella, and her husband, Dan, became friendly with Edward Nichols and his ex-wife, Liza. It's likely Edward and Roy met when their families lived in Washington. Edward was 18 years older than Roy, but despite that, the two men formed a lasting friendship. By 1914, 
Roy and Edward were living in the same place once again, and they continued the friendship they struck up in Washington. Roy found work as a logger for Brooks Scanlon. It was a good job at a big new company in Bend, and Roy was surely happy with the way life was going. But in 1915, tragedy struck. His father, Charles, passed away. And as we lay Charles Wilson to rest, I'd like to say a prayer for his wife, Sarah, and children, Leoella, Rose, and Leroy. May they find the strength to go on without their beloved patriarch. <laughs> oh, Roy, he's really gone, isn't he? What am I going to do? Mother, don't fret. Heck, I'll work twice as hard at the mill if it means I can provide for you and Grandma. I promise. You're too good to me, Leroy. Your father would be proud. Thank you, Mother. With Charles gone, Roy was his mother's only source of support. He kept working as a logger, but soon Uncle Sam's siren song was impossible to ignore. There was a patriotic fervor in the air, and 29-year-old Roy Wilson enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps on May 26, 1917, three years into World War I. Roy felt it was his duty, but it's likely this decision was tough on his mother, Sarah. Roy, are you sure about this? You don't have to prove yourself to anyone. My country needs me. Don't worry, I'll still be able to send you money. It isn't that, Roy. I've already lost your father. I can't lose you too. Mother, I will see you again. Joining the Marines meant Roy was risking his life. But luckily, his company, the 108th, in the 8th Regiment of the Marine Corps, was not deployed to Europe. Instead, in October of 1917, Roy and his fellow soldiers were sent to Galveston, Texas, on a transport ship, the USS Hancock. Though Roy and his fellow Marines never saw combat, their mission was crucial. They were called to patrol the Gulf of Mexico and keep a watchful eye over oil fields in Tampico, Mexico. The U.S. Army relied on that oil, so Galveston was a key strategic outpost. Roy's unit stayed there for almost two years until the war ended on April 25, 1919. While he didn't fight overseas, Roy still spent two years undergoing rigorous training and drilling. He came to be known as rugged and disciplined, a reputation that followed him home to Bend. In 1919, Roy resumed his work as a logger at Brook Scanlon. By then, his mother Sarah lived with her mother Mary in Bend. Incidentally, their neighbor was Guilford Nichols, Edward Nichols' brother. Well, the Wilson and Nichols families continued to be entwined. It's likely that it was this closeness that inspired Edward to ask Roy to join him in the fall and winter of 1923, trapping fur in a remote cabin. I don't know, Ed. You haven't exactly had the best luck up there. Roy Wilson, are you telling me a U.S. Marine is afraid of a little snow? No, but you know how my mother gets when I'm gone. All right, but think how happy she'll be when you come back with that fur money. Or better yet, an elegant mink stole? Didn't realize you were so fashion-minded, Ed. I need a friend, Roy. Someone I can trust. Kimsey is out there, and I want you at my flank when he decides to come back. <sighs> Fine, you old scaredy cat. I'll come. And I think I know a fella who'd make a good third. Roy, as far as I'm concerned, you can invite the whole damn Marine Corps. The final member of the trapping trio was one of Roy Wilson's longtime logging colleagues, Dewey Morris. 25-year-old Dewey lived at a boarding house in Bend and was a foreman at the Brooks Scanlon logging camp alongside his brother, Owen Morris. Roy Wilson had been friends with both Morris brothers for five years thanks to their jobs as loggers at the Brooks Scanlon mill. In 1923, he invited 25-year-old Dewey to join him alongside Edward Nichols at the cabin in Lava Lake. Dewey may have had good reason to want to spend a long winter away from home, only months before this invitation, 
he was accused of sexual assault. In November of 1922, 24-year-old Dewey took a young widow, 27-year-old Mary Pednault, on a date. Afterward, he allegedly assaulted her in his car. Word of the assault spread and inspired an outpouring of local gossip and ribald jokes. It seemed like Ben supported Dewey instead of Mary. Even his bosses at Brooks Scanlon stood behind him. It took months for Mary's case against Dewey to be taken to court, but a trial finally commenced on April 11, 1923. In court, the prosecution only took 15 minutes to deliver evidence to the jury and failed to question Dewey on the stand. Instead, five character witnesses spoke on behalf of Dewey's innocence, and the verdict was not guilty. Journalist Paul Hosmer wrote in his Deschutes Pine Echoes paper, The camps were greatly interested in the Dewey Morris case in circuit court last week, as Dewey is an old hand around all the camps and well known. Dewey was arrested and charged with a statutory crime, but when the case finally reached a jury, it only took them seven minutes to bring in a verdict of not guilty. With this verdict, Dewey Morris was on paper an innocent man. He was surely thrilled with the ruling, but it's likely that the gossip still bothered him. A winter away from the local rumor mill may have been exactly what Dewey needed. He accepted Ed and Roy's invitation, and the team was complete. They made for an unlikely trio. A man afraid of a criminal, a man recently accused of being a criminal, and a U.S. Marine. Roy Wilson's brother-in-law, Hervey D. Ennis, took Roy and Dewey the 25 miles southwest to the cabin in October of 1923. It was just off the northwest shore of Little Lava Lake, giving its residents a charming view of the water. A half-mile trek would lead you to Big Lava Lake. Walking trails were plentiful, and phone service could be found at forest ranger stations scattered throughout the region, so it wasn't completely isolated. Still, getting around would become much trickier in four-foot-deep winter snow. Despite the emotional baggage each man brought with him, their October mood was light. There's a photo of 53-year-old Edward Nichols, 35-year-old Roy Wilson, and 24-year-old Dewey Morris from that first day, likely taken by Hervey Ennis after he drove Roy and Dewey there. In it, Dewey stands on the left, taller and burlier than the other men. Roy stands beside him, posing rather confidently as he pulls a sled full of supplies, the strong man of the group. On the other side of the sled is Edward, older than the other two with an easy smile on his face. Behind them, the small log cabin is nestled between the trees, a picturesque place where they would make themselves at home. And back here are Ed Logan's fox pens. Boy, these are five of the most beautiful creatures I've ever seen. <laughs> They'll look even more beautiful on a pretty lady as a coat. Can you imagine the look on some gal's face when you show up at her door with a brand new fox fur coat? Sure, Dewey. Say, Maybe if you'd given Mary a coat like that, she would have been more amenable to you on that date. <laughs> hey, I was proven innocent. Boys, don't start a ruckus. We're about to be in tight quarters for months, so here's the rules. We take turns caring for Logan's foxes. When we're not doing that, we can set up a trap line in the woods and trap some furs on our own. And when we're not doing that, we can sip some moonshine, have a few laughs, and try not to kill each other before we go home in the spring. I'm gonna need to visit Mother at Christmas. That's fine. I figured we could snowshoe back to town around Christmas to sell some furs anyway. If we last until then. You okay, Ed? You know he's not gonna come back. Who? Who's not coming back? Don't worry about it, Dew. Ed, we're safe here. I'll make sure of that. Thank you. Thank you both. The mood was light on the day of Roy and Dewey's arrival, but soon, snow would cover the ground, the lava lakes would freeze over, and the stage would be set for one of Oregon's most infamous crimes. Coming up, the three men spend a tense winter at the cabin near the lava lakes. And now, back to the story. 
By mid-December of 1923, 53-year-old Edward Nichols, 35-year-old Roy Wilson, and 24-year-old Dewey Morris had been holed up in a cabin in Oregon's Deschutes Forest for almost two months. They were there to care for Edward Logan's five silver foxes, which meant being present for regular food deliveries. They also had the gruesome task of skinning the animals for their valuable pelts once they were grown. The men ran trap lines across the woods, catching their own animals to produce fox, marten, and mink fur. It was a tough job, but they all got along, cooking together and sharing meals. Now, despite the good times, a specter hung above this little cabin in the woods. The threat of Charles Kimsey's return was a heavy burden for Edward Nichols to bear. Mm, how could I have been such an idiot? Trusting Collins? His name wasn't even Collins. You're being hard on yourself, Ed. We've been through this. Yeah, almost every night. It's kind of creeping me out, Ed. You don't understand. I pride myself on being a tough guy, but that low-life thief fooled me for months, and he's out there with my $500. You've got nothing to worry about, Ed. There's three of us, and only one of him. Right. Well, unless Kimsey brings back up two. Lord, Dewey! Why'd you have to say that? Now Ed's gonna... <laughs> <laughs> you okay, Ed? Hell, I don't know. It's just... I guess I could stand to lighten up a bit. I'm glad you're both here. Over the winter of 1923 and early 1924, there were only three reported sightings of the trio. The first was at Christmas. Edward Nichols and Roy Wilson snowshoed back to Bend to sell their first set of furs and spend the holidays with their friends and families. No one knows whether Dewey Morris also went home or stayed at the cabin. Perhaps he was still wary of the gossip surrounding the assault accusations against him and wanted to keep away. Roy Wilson's widowed mother, Sarah, was thrilled to have her son home. Merry Christmas, mother. Roy, you're home. My baby boy. Go on, Roy. Have some more of this roast. I know it's your favorite. Mother, I'm stuffed. Boy, your cooking sure beats Ed Nichols. How is Ed? He holding up all right? Why wouldn't he be? Oh, come now, Roy. I may be your old mother, but I'm not blind. It's no secret that Kimsey man terrified him. I know he wants you there for protection. I think he's a little paranoid. It's nothing to worry about. And yet I'm going to worry. You help Ed out, but don't put yourself in harm's way for nothing. You hear me? Mother knows best. Yes, she does. Now, are you sure you have to leave tomorrow morning? That's when Ed's heading back. We'll spend another few weeks up there, then be home by February. Is that a promise? Would a Marine break a promise? As 1923 ended and 1924 began, the second sighting of Ed, Roy, and Dewey occurred. On January 15th, Alan Wilcoxon, the owner of a local Elk Lake resort and an acquaintance of Ed Nichols, stopped by the cabin for dinner. <laughs> Alan! Alan, you've got to have another glass. One more pour, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Ed Nichols! This is murder by moonshine. It's cold out there, Alan. Gotta stay warm, right? Roy, will you talk some sense into these fools? I am a representative of the U.S. Marine Corps, and I am ordering you to drink. <laughs> oh, you guys are too much. All right, then. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Wilcoxon later reported that the mood was happy and light during their dinner together. He spent the night at the cabin with the three trappers before heading out in the morning. Well, this brings us to the third sighting of Ed, Roy, and Dewey on January 22nd, 1924. This sighting is more unusual because it was nowhere near Bend or the Deschutes Forest. In fact, it was 120 miles away in Portland, Oregon. Carl Schumacher, the owner of the Schumacher Fur Company, bought $110 worth of fur from a group of trappers from Bend. Selling furs required a trapper's license, 
and the license presented at the time of sale was Edward Nichols. What was Edward doing selling furs so far from Bend? Well, that's a question that would matter greatly in the investigation that followed. The fur sale in Portland on January 22, 1924, was the last official sign of activity from any of the three trappers. At first, their friends and families in Bend may not have worried. After all, Roy had told his mother that he'd be back in February. But soon it was March, and motherly intuition was nagging at Sarah Wilson. She knew Roy kept his promises, and she knew something was wrong. The first person she likely turned to was her son-in-law, Hervey Ennis, the man who took Roy and Dewey up to the cabin back in October 1923. I'm telling you, Hervey, something's not right. Roy said he'd be home in February, and it's almost mid-April. I know, and I miss having Roy around too. But plans change. It's still snowing up there. He and the others probably just want to wait until the trip home's easier. It was Kimsey. I just know it. Sarah, get a hold of yourself. He hasn't been spotted in a year. Ed brought Roy up there to protect him from Kimsey, and I think he got to them. What are you saying, exactly? I think they're dead. I think my Roy's dead. Don't say that. We don't know. Then go up there and find out. If you don't, I'll do it myself. All right. All right. I'll go. Hervey. Don't go alone. The first people to make their way up on April 13th were Roy's brother-in-law, Hervey Innes, and Dewey Morris's brother, Owen, who worked alongside Roy at Brooks Scanlon. Snow was still on the forest ground and went up to four feet deep in some places. The cabin was still somewhat inaccessible, so the men drove to an access point near Snow Creek Road but that was still seven miles south of Little Lava Lake. Hervey and Owen had to use snowshoes to walk the remaining distance in the cold. When they arrived at the cabin, they found it in total disarray. Trash was strewn everywhere, dishes were moldy, and the calendar was still turned to January, despite it being April. The only sign of life was an emaciated cat. But what was more concerning was the fact that Edward, Roy, and Dewey's coats, rifles, and snow boots were still there. All their gear was clean and spotless, almost like the men were prepared for a trapping trip they never took. It was extremely unlikely that they'd leave the cabin without their coats, much less their boots, unless they had no choice. Frantic, Hervey and Owen rushed to search the land around the cabin. Logan's foxes are gone. Think maybe they got hungry and escaped? No, there's still food in their pans. I'm thinking they were stolen. What's that you just stepped on? It's, uh, it looks like shotgun shells. Eight of them. Owen, you better come over here. What's that? Pretty sure it's a bloodstain. What happened next is unclear. Some reports indicate that Owen Morris and Hervey Ennis stayed that day and proceeded to make a number of discoveries. Others indicate that they returned the next day with Edward Logan and Deputy Sheriff Clarence Adams. What we know is this. In addition to finding eight shotgun shells and a bloodstain, the men also discovered a series of sled tracks. One of the trapper sleds was missing a six-foot-long hand-pulled model that they used to carry back animal carcasses. The men followed the tracks about a half a mile to the shores of Big Lava Lake, which was still frozen over with a thick layer of ice. There, they found the missing sled, partially hidden in the snow. Owen, look. That stain. Is that more blood? I'm afraid so. Hervey, the river, on the ice. I think those are sled tracks. Looks like it. Can't tell for sure. Did they cross the lake? I'm sorry, Owen. I think we found them. What do you mean? I think they're right here, under the ice. They would have to wait until the ice melted. But as soon as it thawed, the awful truth would float to the surface. Edward, Roy, and Dewey 
had been murdered. In April of 1924, news traveled throughout Oregon that three fur trappers had vanished from their cabin near the city of Bend. And 120 miles away in Portland, fur seller Carl Schumacher came to a chilling realization. Eddie Clark, what's a game warden doing away from his post? Bit antsy alone in the woods, Carl. You read the story in the Oregonian? about the missing trappers in Bend? Yep, scary world out there. Say, where'd you get these furs? Don't get too many silver foxes around here. I know, I got them on January 22nd. Bought four fox furs off a man named Ed Nichols. Carl, how close did you read that Oregonian article? I mean, it was a busy morning. Because Edward Nichols is one of those missing trappers, and he was last seen on January 15th. So, that means... Carl Schumacher, you may be the last person to have seen those men alive. By April of 1924, Sarah Wilson was praying for a sign that her 36-year-old son, Roy, was alive. Roy Wilson worked as a logger for the Brooks Scanlon Lumber Company in Bend, Oregon. But the previous winter, Roy and his 23-year-old co-worker, Dewey Morris, set off to a remote cabin by Little Lava Lake, 25 miles away. They'd gone at the behest of Roy's longtime friend, 53-year-old Edward Nichols. They were there to collect fox pelts, but Edward's presence made Sarah nervous for her own son's safety. Edward had spent the previous winter at the cabin with a fur trapper who went by Lee Collins. But Lee Collins' real name was Charles Kimsey. He was an escapee from an Idaho prison. Kimsey accused Edward of cheating him out of his fair pay. In retaliation, he robbed both Edward Nichols and the cabin owner, Ed Logan. He also swore he'd get revenge. On his way out of town in August of 1923, Kimsey assaulted taxi driver William Harrison before disappearing without a trace. Worried that Kimsey would come back that winter and make good on his threats, Edward Nichols persuaded Roy and Dewey to stay at Lava Lake with him during the next trapping season. Roy was an ex-Marine, and Dewey was a young, strapping logger, so they would make the perfect backup if Kimsey returned. Roy told his mother, Sarah, he'd be home for good in February of 1924. But by April, the trappers still hadn't returned. She worried something terrible had happened. Sarah persuaded her son-in-law, Hervey Innes, to trek up to the cabin along with Dewey's brother, Owen Morris. There, they discovered Sarah's motherly intuition was spot on. The cabin was deserted and had been for a while. There was moldy food in the oven. The calendar was still turned to January. And despite the snow outside, the trappers hunting in snow gear laid in the house, clean and unused. In addition, Ed Logan's five valuable foxes were missing, and they found blood and shotgun shells on the ground. Hervey and Owen knew they had to search further. A half a mile away at Big Lava Lake, they found the trapper's sled at the frozen lakeshore. It was stained with more blood. On April 15, 1924, Deschutes County Sheriff Burt Roberts sent the best man for the job to investigate, Deputy Sheriff Clarence Adams. He was the former district game warden and knew the woods well. Adams, I needed to track down some missing foxes. Pardon? Sheriff, what about the men? I've got people on that, but it strikes me as peculiar that Ed Logan's silver foxes are missing from their pen. I'd say they ran off to hunt, but their food trays are still full. Now you know how pricey their pelts are. You think they were stolen? Exactly, Adams. Follow the foxes. As the search began, news of the disappearance spread through the town of Bend like a chilling cautionary tale. Many Bend residents trapped fur or ran camps in the isolated woods. They probably worried that something like this could happen to them, too. One of these men was local camp manager Alan Wilcoxon. When he heard about the trapper's plight, he realized he was one of the last people to see them alive. 
Allen told Sheriff Roberts that on January 15, 1924, he spent the night at the cabin on his way back to his camp. Oh, we had a nice dinner and all of them were cheery. Probably because they had $3,000 of fur they were itching to sell. That's all you remember? We may have had a few tipples that night. And that was the last time I saw them. God bless their souls. Meanwhile, three days into the police investigation, Deputy Sheriff Adams got the first major break in the case. He made a grisly discovery at the Lava Lake cabin. I need a bag! What for? Whoa! Deputy Adams, are are those Ed Logan's foxes? Frozen and skinned. Poor critters. Now get these back to Sheriff, quick! before it gets dark. But the find likely only frustrated Sheriff Roberts. So, Ed Logan's pricey silver foxes were killed and skinned. I'm hoping the first turn up somewhere close. What about the blood sample from the sled? Local doc says it's not human blood, but all he's got is a rinky-dink microscope. I'm having the sample sent to the med school at the University of Oregon, hoping the brainiacs tell me differently. Understood. I'll keep investigating the men's trap lines. Sure. Gotta occupy ourselves until Big Lava Lake melts, I suppose. You think the men are under the lake, don't you? Case won't crack until the ice does. The next day, April 19th, the investigators got another big break. Four of the missing fox pelts were found at the Schumacher Fur Company in Portland, 120 miles away from Bend. Edward Nichols' trapping license was used on January 22, 1924, to sell furs to Carl Schumacher. When Portland authorities spoke to Carl, they learned an unsettling truth. Mr. Schumacher, I'm going to show you a picture of Edward Nichols. I need you to tell me if he's one of the men who sold you furs on January 22. No, sir. This is not the Edward Nichols who came into my store. This meant the last time Edward Nichols, Roy Wilson, and Dewey Morris were truly seen alive was on January 15, 1924, when Alan Wilcoxon had dinner at the Lava Lake cabin. On January 22nd, two unknown men showed up in Portland and used Edward's stolen trapping license to sell Logan's furs. Portland traffic cop Walter Bender also reported that he met two men on January 22nd, They were carrying pelts and asked him to recommend a fur seller. When Bender was shown a picture of Edward Nichols, he didn't recognize the man in the photo either. In an interview with the Oregonian, a Portland deputy named Christofferson presented his theory. The trail is an old one and it's cold. The fact that the murders were committed about January 15th and that the furs were sold here a week later would indicate that the man who sold the furs and who exhibited Nichols' trapper's license is the man responsible for the triple killing. All of this must have overwhelmed Ed Logan, the owner of the cabin. He'd already had trouble at his cabin in 1923 when he was robbed by Charles Kimsey. Now, less than a year later, Ed Logan found himself searching for clues about an even more ominous occurrence at his cabin. Knowing a bloody sled was found by Big Lava Lake, Logan and Deputy Adams ventured onto the frozen lake surface for answers. About a hundred yards out, they found one. Adams, get out here. Look, a hole. It's kind of frozen over now, but you see the edges? Doesn't that look like blood? Maybe so. Sure as hell doesn't look like Mother Nature's doing to me. More like someone took a hatchet to the ice in a hurry. And wait, look. It's hair, brown and fine. Just like Roy Wilson's. If someone shoved the bodies in here, we gotta get a team to break up the ice. No, feel the air. That spring breeze? Give it a few days and this ice will break up in no time. After discovering the frozen over hole in the lake, this was no longer a missing persons case. Investigators were convinced Edward, Roy, and Dewey were dead. As they waited for the ice to melt, Sheriff Roberts and Deputy Adams checked out other leads. 
they investigated a trapper and moonshiner named Indian Erickson, who had a bad reputation in a camp six miles south at Cultus Lake. But he had a solid alibi and was ruled out. They searched Ed, Roy, and Dewey's trap lines, but all they found in the untended traps were remains of a skunk, four wild foxes, and 12 wild marten. Some sources mention that more physical evidence was found around the lake and cabin, a missing tooth and a bloody hammer in the tool shed. Finally, with Mother Nature's help, the icy lake surface melted. At 5.30 p.m. on April 23rd, investigators found the missing trappers. Deputy Adams and Hervey Innes were coming back from a trap line search when they stopped by Big Lava Lake to catch fish for dinner. Hervey, look, over there, down the shore, floating. What are those? I think they're bodies, three of them. Get the boat, now. Edward, Roy, and Dewey were dead in the water. Horrific injuries covered their partly frozen bodies. Edward had bullet holes on his face and neck, and Roy had wounds on his ear and shoulder. The youngest victim, Dewey, had the most gruesome injuries of all. Someone had beaten his face into a bloody, unrecognizable mess. The bodies were rushed to Bend, where county physician Ray Hendershot examined them. This gruesome triple murder was undoubtedly beyond the scope of anything the small town doctor had ever seen. Edward's jaw was partly blown off by a shotgun, and he also had another bullet lodged in his throat. His reading glasses, which he wore indoors, were still on his body, and his pocket watch was stopped at 9.10. And we don't know if that's a.m. or p.m., but it likely stopped when Edward was plunged into Big Lava Lake. The glasses and lack of outerwear indicated he may have been killed indoors or had rushed outside suddenly. The shotgun wounds indicated the killer could have shot him from a distance, perhaps in a sneak attack. Roy had a shotgun wound in the back of his head by his right ear. He also had shotgun wounds on his right side, which blew off the top of his shoulder. Like Edward, the injuries indicated Roy may have been shot from a distance. And finally, the brutally massacred Dewey. He'd been shot through the middle of his left arm, but that's not what killed him. Dewey's face was battered by blunt force trauma. This was likely related to the bloody hammer discovered at the cabin. Unlike Edward and Roy, Dewey was killed up close, perhaps after the shooter failed to take him down with a bullet to the arm. Investigators placed the date of death around January 15, 1924, the same day they had all been seen alive by Alan Wilcoxon. It might seem obvious to suspect Alan, since he admitted to visiting the cabin on January 15th. However, it appears he was never seen as a suspect, maybe because Sheriff Roberts already had one firmly in mind. He just needed confirmation from police officer Walter Bender in Portland before proceeding. Officer Bender, here's a photo from Sheriff Roberts in Bend. Can you tell me if this is the man who pretended to be Edward Nichols? Yes, absolutely. That's him. That's the man I spoke to. With Officer Bender's confirmation, Sheriff Roberts was ready to make his suspicions public. It is my suspicion that the killer responsible for these crimes is Charles Kimsey, and I am offering a $1,500 reward for anyone who could bring him and his accomplice in. The hunt for Kimsey was on. When we return, We'll follow the investigation as it closes in on its main suspect. And now, back to the story. In late April of 1924, Deschutes County Sheriff Burt Roberts named 38-year-old Charles Kimsey as his prime suspect in the murder of three trappers at Oregon's Lava Lakes. There was just one problem. No one knew where Kimsey was. Damn it, Adams! This devil Kimsey is taunting me. I know, Sheriff, but I've been reading old Charlie Kimsey's record, and it seems to me he's been a slippery fella his whole life. 
Charles Hyde Kimsey was born on October 12, 1885 in Caldwell, Ohio. His parents divorced in 1892, when young Charles was just seven. He dropped out of the ninth grade in 1901, but that is all that's known about his childhood. Likewise, there's no trace of Kimsey's teens and early 20s. All we know is at the age of 28, he began his life of crime. Kimsey was arrested for stealing grain in Blaine County, Idaho, in the summer of 1914. He was charged with grand larceny, which means the grain had significant value. The following June, he served a prison sentence at a work farm at the Idaho State Penitentiary. It was a chance for him to turn his life around. Yeah! Yeah! Hey! <laughs> hey! <laughs> Somebody stop that horse! Kimsey! But instead, in October, Kimsey escaped on a stolen workhorse. Oddly, he stayed in Idaho and took refuge at his older brother's home. Then, he applied for a job as a sheep herder for the Fall Creek Sheep Company. All right, kid. Anything I should know about? Criminal record, angry ex-wife, anything else that would disturb my flock? No, sir. Just trying to make a living. Good man. Remind me your name again? It's Bob. Bob Dales. It wasn't the last time Charles Kimsey used an alias to escape his past. Sometimes he was Bob Dales, or Thomas Rose. Other times, it was Tom Collins, perhaps a quirky ode to the popular drink. His next alias was one we know well, Lee Collins. In the spring of 1922, 37-year-old Kimsey came to Oregon's Elk Lake, 25 miles west of Bend. He worked at a campsite managed by Karen Degermark and quickly endeared himself to her. Collins, you missed a spot. This floor should be so clean we could eat off of it. Oh, is that so? Miss Dagermark, are you asking me out to dinner? Collins, you rascal. That's inappropriate. <laughs> Save that silver tongue for my customers. Yes, ma'am. When asked about Kimsey, Karen Dagermark said he was one of the best employees she'd ever had. It seems he charmed everyone he met, and he quickly made new friends in the Deschutes Forest. One such friend was Alan Wilcoxon, who eventually took over Karen Dagermark's camp. He was later the last man to see Ed, Roy, and Dewey alive. We don't know how close they were, and the friendship doesn't necessarily paint Wilcoxon in a bad light. After all, Kimsey was working a normal job and living a normal life, albeit under a fake name. Kimsey blew up that sense of normalcy after he robbed Edward Nichols and Ed Logan and fled Oregon in 1923. Then, Kimsey became a suspect in the Lava Lake murders, and Sheriff Roberts sounded the alarm to find Kimsey that April of 1924. Even though they knew who they were looking for, they had no idea where they would find him. With so many aliases, Kimsey's trail was cold. Edward, Roy, and Dewey were buried at Ben's Greenwood Cemetery on April 25, 1924. They had matching headstones and were interred side by side. The mood was somber as Reverend F. H. Beard gave a heartfelt sermon. These men were the victims of an inhuman catastrophe that causes us to cry for justice and vengeance. God rest their souls and God bless their loved ones. As the trappers' families grieved, Sheriff Roberts pursued the case. After the funeral, he received word that break-ins had occurred in two cabins on the Mackenzie River Trail in late January of 1924, just days after the murders. Adams, we've got a break-in at a cabin at Frizzell Crossing around January 19th, and then another one on the 20th. Both times, the intruders spent the night and stole some food before moving on. Frizzell Crossing's about 12 miles west of the Lava Lakes. Looks like they were hiking along the Mackenzie River Trail. If they were on that trail by January 20th, how easy would it be for them to get to Portland and sell those furs on the 22nd? Sheriff Roberts, that's tough terrain. They'd have to cover 35 miles of terrain on the 21st. 
He'd have to be an experienced hiker. Mm, Kimsey knows these woods. I'd buy it. Especially if he had a partner helping him along. Maybe they hitched a ride with someone on a wagon? Fair enough. If they got out of the woods and made it to Lowell by the night of the 21st, or even early on the 22nd, they could have hopped on the train at the Natron cutoff rail and made it to Portland before noon. Well, plenty of time to make it to Schumacher's store. Adams, this is Kimsey's trail. Based on this information, investigators adjusted the suspected date of the murders from January 15th to January 18th. But even with this extra insight, it came too late. Kimsey was still out of sight. Sheriff Roberts kept Deputy Adams assigned to the case over the next few years. But no new leads arose, and no progress was made. The case took another turn for the worse in 1927, when Adams was killed in a car accident. In 1928, sawmill owner and friend of Alan Wilcoxon replaced Roberts as sheriff. With the two most dedicated investigators dead or out of office, the Lava Lake murder investigation ground to a halt. Charles Kimsey, on the other hand, was just getting started. From 1925 on, Kimsey committed a dizzying array of crimes that cemented his reputation as an unabashed criminal. He forged a bad check for $715, that's over $10,000 today, in Pocatello, Idaho in 1925. Later in December, he arrived in Salt Lake City under the name William Becker. He was hired to help a man named David Howard to drive him from Salt Lake to Tampa, Florida. When they stopped in Las Vegas, Kimsey allegedly stabbed Howard to death and dumped his body in the desert. Kimsey stole the car, adopted the name W.R. Howe, and vacationed in San Diego, spending all of Howard's traveler's checks in the process. After that, he conned a man named D.R. Hurd into helping him drive Howard's car to Tampa. He soon made Hurd his accomplice in an armed robbery on the road. All right, everybody, listen up. Hand over your valuables, and maybe we all make it out alive. Hurd, grab that lady's watch. Yes, sir. Later, Kimsey robbed Hurd, tied him to a tree, and drove off. He sold David Howard's car to two other robbers for $25, then moved to Wyoming in 1927. Well, the next year in Idaho, he was accused of forging bad checks, selling stolen wool, and killing another man. Though Kimsey had police departments in multiple states after him, he always seemed to slip from their grip. If he committed the Lava Lake murders, it was as if his first killings had fully unleashed his deadly criminal nature. For nine years, he seemed unstoppable. But his luck finally ran out on March 9th, 1933, in Kalispell, Montana. Charles Kimsey, you're under arrest. <laughs> Officer, you must be confused. You see, my name is Tom Collins, not... What did you call me? Quincy? Yeah, yeah, save it for the judge, Collins. Kimsey wasn't arrested in Montana for murder or robbery, but rather for the only crime to which he could be concretely traced. Check forgery. But he wasn't kept in Montana for long. Step out of the cell. You're taking a little trip. I suppose I'll miss this Montana hospitality. Where are they taking me? Oregon, I heard. What? Oregon? What's got you so skittish, Kimsey? They think I killed those trappers, but I didn't. I was in Colorado working on the Moffat Tunnel at the time. I didn't kill them. Deschutes County Sheriff Claude McCauley successfully petitioned to have Kimsey return to Oregon to be questioned about the Lava Lake murders. Upon hearing of his transfer, Kimsey was allegedly very upset. He immediately insisted that he had an alibi for the Trapper murders. He oddly knew what crimes he was suspected of committing long before anybody had told him what he was wanted for. After nine years on the run, Charles Kimsey was headed back to face the wrath of Bend. Up next, we'll find out exactly what happens to suspected murderer Charles Kimsey. And now, the conclusion to our story. 
After a nine-year manhunt, 47-year-old Charles Kimsey arrived at Oregon's Deschutes County Jail on March 16, 1933. There, he was charged with three counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Edward Nichols, Roy Wilson, and Dewey Morris. Kimsey expected these charges, but to his surprise, he was also charged for the August 1923 assault and robbery of taxi driver William Harrison. Well, authorities knew the evidence in the Harrison case was stronger, and in the meantime, they had an excuse to probe further into the Lava Lake mystery. Somewhat unusually, Deschutes County Sheriff Claude McCauley let victim Roy Wilson's brother-in-law, Hervey Innes, question Kimsey. Hervey was a civilian, an active helper in the 1924 investigation, and he was emotionally invested in the case. Kimsey, the sooner you talk, the sooner I leave you alone. I want to know what happened at the cabin. I don't have to talk to you. You ain't a cop. Roy was my wife's brother. I brought him to that cabin. I spent days telling his poor mother that nothing happened to him, that she was wrong. And then I had to tell her she was right. So go ahead and tell me how you couldn't have killed them. I was working at the Moffat Tunnel in January, in Colorado. Take your little tantrum somewhere else. I'm not your guy. Bend authorities quickly got to work checking Kimsey's alibi. As local news outlets eagerly tracked the story, the public pressured investigators to close the case and prove Kimsey was the Lava Lakes killer. If Kimsey's name or some of the many aliases he has used can be found on the Moffat Tunnel payroll, or if canceled checks can be produced, the solution to the Lava Lake murder may be just as remote as it was on that April day in 1924. It turns out, Kimsey was telling the truth. He did start a building job on December 16, 1923, at Colorado's Moffat Tunnel. Of course, he signed on under the alias Tom Collins, so even Kimsey's truths were peppered with lies. But the job being real didn't completely eliminate him as a suspect. Kimsey's job at the tunnel ended on January 7, 1924. He collected his pay and left that day. It's possible that he went back to Oregon and committed the murders on January 18th. An unnamed local trapper told Sheriff McCauley that he saw Kimsey in Oregon on January 12, 1924. Apparently, Kimsey said he was going to set up camp at Cultus Lake, six miles south of the Lava Lakes. This statement placed Kimsey in Oregon around the time of the murders, but there was still no way to prove he was actually at the Lava Lakes on the day the trappers died. Hoping to attack the case from a different angle, Authorities took Kimsey to Portland on April 1st, 1933. There, he was put in a police lineup. Authorities brought in traffic officer Walter Bender and fur seller Carl Schumacher and asked them to identify Kimsey among the men in the lineup. Officer Bender, do you recognize any of the men here as Charles Kimsey, the man you encountered on January 22nd, 1924? Gosh, you know, it's been nine years. One of these fellas maybe looks familiar, but I'm just not 100% sure. Kimsey had aged significantly in his last crime-filled decade, and Schumacher and Bender couldn't confirm he was the man they'd met nine years ago. Investigators could no longer reliably place Kimsey in Portland on January 22nd, 1924, a fact they had previously relied on. Without a confession, hard evidence, or reliable eyewitnesses placing Kimsey at the cabin on the day of the murders, authorities had no grounds to pursue the murder charges. But they could put Kimsey on trial for his 1923 armed assault and robbery of William Harrison. In a way, the trial was just a pretense. While Harrison certainly deserved justice, most of Bend felt Kimsey was on trial for the Lava Lake murders. So much so that Kimsey's attorney, Ross Farnham, had to dismiss several jury candidates during the selection process. Ma'am, is there anything that would prevent you from serving in an unbiased capacity as a juror in the matter of the Harrison assault and robbery? 
Well, yes, sir. Can you elaborate? He killed Ed Nichols and his friends in 1923. I mean, everybody knows it. With such biased public opinion, it's virtually impossible to say that Kimsey's trial was fair. Charles Kimsey's trial officially began on April 20th, 1933, and it was the hottest ticket in town. The trial against the infamous Charles Hyde Kimsey has begun, with over 150 spectators eager for answers and burning for justice. A fight nearly broke out when bailiff Sam Newell kicked early arrivals out of their prime bench seats. But of course, he had to make room for the actual jurors. The trial started off with a bang. Harrison took the stand and identified Kimsey as his attacker. Prosecutors claimed Kimsey should be charged for attempted murder since he tried to poison Harrison and left him for dead. But Kimsey was clever. Mr. Kimsey, are you saying you did not intend to murder William Harrison? I tied him up and left him in that cistern so I could make my getaway before he could call the police. Sure, I had a pistol, but all I did was clock him over the head with it. I spared his life. Kimsey's lawyer argued that he couldn't be charged with attempted murder since he had an opportunity to murder Harrison, but chose not to. Kimsey successfully dodged a murder charge, but that's as far as his ingenuity got him. On April 22nd, Kimsey was found guilty of assault and robbery while armed with a dangerous weapon. Judge T.E.J. Duffy sentenced him to life in prison. In a statement on the day of the sentencing, Duffy made his feelings clear. Kimsey is absolutely without any moral respectability. The attack on Harrison was the most heinous crime ever committed in the most cold-blooded manner. Calling Kimsey's assault of Harrison the most heinous crime ever committed is a bit of a stretch, but perhaps even Judge Duffy could not stay neutral when sentencing the suspected Lava Lake killer. With his fate sealed, Kimsey began his life sentence at the Oregon State Penitentiary, where he quickly got up to his old tricks. On August 5th, 1945, he attempted to escape the prison labor gang, but guards quickly caught him. After 12 uneventful years, he came up for parole in June 1957. The judge at this hearing was unaware of Kinsey's likely involvement in the Lava Lake murders. From my understanding of this man's case, no lives were lost as a result of this crime. Therefore, I feel that it is possible that his sentence is too severe and would recommend that his sentence be commuted to a term more in keeping with his crime. On August 5th, 1957, Charles Kimsey was released after 24 years in prison. He was 72 years old. He returned to Idaho and never committed another crime again, at least none that we know of. Kimsey died in 1976 at the age of 91. With him died the chance for the world to know what really happened at the Lava Lake cabin in the woods. While he was never convicted, it's safe to say Charles Kimsey is the most likely Lava Lake killer. He had a criminal past and a clear motive. Revenge on Edward Nichols and Ed Logan for cheating him out of his fur profits. I agree. While Kimsey's guilt feels like a given, the question still remains. Who was his unidentified accomplice in the Lava Lake murders? The second man who was seen selling furs in Portland in her book, The Trapper Murders, Melanie Tupper presents a theory. Kimsey's sidekick was the twisted serial killer, Ray Van Buren Jackson. Well, alleged twisted serial killer, we have to take this darkly imaginative theory with a grain of salt. In the late 1890s, 20-something Ray Jackson was arrested for forgery and robbery and spent three years in the Oregon State Penitentiary. He reinvented himself in the early 1900s as a school teacher in secluded Silver Lake, Oregon. He nicknamed himself Professor, but shades of his past remained. He kept a baseball bat and a revolver at his desk to intimidate his students and had no qualms about disciplining them with whips. Jackson retired after trying to embezzle from the school district, 
Though his crimes were mainly financial, Jackson was also a background player in many suspicious deaths. In 1904, he was the last person to see businessman J. Creed Kahn alive after they had breakfast together. Kahn disappeared that day, and his body was found seven weeks later in a suicide that seemed like it may have been staged. Before his death, Kahn was trying to find out who stole $3,000 from his bank account. Soon afterwards, Jackson bought around $3,000 in cattle. In 1930, Jackson's neighbor Ira Bradley was found dead, his face beaten in by the butt of a revolver, eerily similar to how the Lava Lake victim Dewey Morris died. The connections don't end there either, because Ray Jackson was Charles Kimsey's distant cousin. Jackson was born around 1870 and was 15 years older than Kimsey. There was bad blood between their families, and they were not raised near each other. However, Tupper theorizes they may have met at the 1920 wedding of Archie Warner in Silver Lake, where Jackson lived. Warner was a friend of Kimsey's and later testified on his behalf in the 1933 trial. Say, who are you? I feel like I know a lot of Archie's pals, but we haven't met. The name's Kimsey. Charles Kimsey. Of the Idaho Kimseys? How do you know that? Why, boy, my name is Ray Jackson, and I believe we may just be cousins. It's a fascinating theory. Two long-lost cousins with a penchant for crime who teamed up to commit one of Oregon's grisliest murders. But despite being around many deaths, Jackson was never formally accused of murder. The only crimes he was ever found guilty of were forgery and theft. Even if Jackson was secretly a killer, we then have to presume Kimsey somehow knew this fact or had some other reason to request Jackson's help with the murders. Perhaps he trusted him due to their familial connection. However, they were distant relatives. Also, Jackson was 54 at the time of the murders. If Kimsey wanted help taking down two woodsmen and a Marine, it seems odd that he would ask his middle-aged schoolteacher cousin. The theory seems a little more far-fetched when we consider his age and occupation. Perhaps a more plausible suspect is Alan Wilcoxon. He was the manager of the campsite who was friendly with both the victims and Kimsey. Friendly enough that Kimsey used him as a character witness in a 1940 parole hearing. Crucially, Wilcoxon was the last man to see the trappers alive on January 15, 1924, the original suspected date of the murders. If Kimsey was really in Oregon in early January of 1924, it's possible he could have called on his old friend Alan to help him settle an old score. Collins, what are you doing here? If anyone sees you... I need your help, Alan. I want what's mine at Ed Logan's cabin. Did you visit them like I asked you to? Yeah, I did. They're high on the hog, loaded with furs. So, the time is right. What are you thinking? Wilson's a damn Marine. Even if you go in there, guns are blazing, you don't stand a chance. That's why I need you by my side. Oh, hell, Collins. These guys are my friends. Look, they might have screwed you over, but can't you just... I don't know. Steal the foxes? That's what I intend to do. Then why the shotgun? <laughs> Can I have a little fun while I'm at it? Alan Wilcoxon was never a suspect, despite his friendship with Kimsey. Perhaps because he'd freely told authorities that he was the last man to see them, he was able to hide in plain sight. He was also close with Deschutes County Sheriff Claude McCauley. Could McCauley have avoided looking into his good friend? It's possible, but it may not matter in the end. Any accomplice was likely just extra manpower. Kimsey was the criminal with a killer grudge. Kimsey was almost definitely a guilty man. The 1924 Lava Lake murders scarred the city of Bend and altered the course of several families' lives. They were a product of their unique time and place in American history, a world where isolation was a norm, 
Technology could only get you so far, and business disputes might be settled with shotgun ambushes. Years later, the Oregon Geographic Names Board paid respect to the victims by naming a set of three buttes near Crane Prairie, the Three Trappers. Their murders were never solved, but similar slayings will likely never happen again. The Deschutes Forest is no longer what it was back in 1924, a mysterious place rife with traps for unsuspecting animals and unsuspecting people.